I'm Jeff Payne with Mises nice Center. Uh, to kick us off with the introductions, Antoine, I will turn to you. If you do not mind, uh, the floor is yours. Jeff, um, good uh, day. Good morning to our colleagues in the United States and good afternoon to others who may be in uh, Europe uh, or elsewhere. My name is Antoine Levesque. I'm a research fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, which I joined uh, back in 2009. I work especially on India, the Indian Ocean, Pakistan and nuclear issues. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Antoine, for joining us. Averla, to you. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Viola Nowens, and I'm a research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies in London. Um, I cover really um, the bandwidth of uh, the Indo-Pacific at RUSI, where I try and focus on maritime uh, security issues chiefly. Um, this really includes uh, China's rise, of course, uh, and specifically what that means for uh, non-traditional security issues across this maritime domain. Um, I was previously working uh, for the European Union in Singapore at the delegation there, where I, of course, looked at maritime security uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is intrinsically part of, uh, you know, an interconnected web of transnational crime issues, of sovereignty claims issues, uh, and of regional cooperation between the Indian Ocean region and, of course, the rest of Asia. Uh, so happy to be here uh, and looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Well, I'm always glad to, to, see, and to see you and as well to learn from you. Um, glad you're here today. Uh, Viraj, to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, good morning to all in the US and good afternoon to all in uh, Europe. I'm Viraj Solanke. I'm a research associate in the South Asia program at the International Institute for Strategic Studies based in London, along with uh, my colleague Antoine. And my main focus is looking at uh, the uh, littoral and island states of the Indian Ocean and India and China's engagement with these uh, island nations. Well, good afternoon to you, Varaj. Uh, yeah, it is morning here. Um, I've already mainlined my coffee, so um, I should be alert. Um, Frederick, um, to you, sir, for your introduction. Yes, good morning and thank you for having me this morning. Uh, I'm Frédéric Graar. I am a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace based in Paris and I work in the past for the, uh, the MOD and MEA in Paris and I've been based in uh, South Asia for quite some time as well as in DC for uh, a number of years and I work more specifically on the Indo-Pacific and Indian Ocean issues. I'm I'm so glad to to to, to well see you digitally again, Frederick. Uh, we we talked briefly at at uh, at Shangri La, which uh, seems like you know decades ago, given everything that's going on in the world. But um, today we're Europe's perspectives on what's happening in the Indian Ocean region. So I gave all of you a heads up on some of the questions that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to start off with those first two questions to you, and we'll just go around the horn, and then from there. I'll ask follow-ups, but feel free as well to ask questions of your fellow presenters or, or to me uh, on uh, some of the issues you may be interested about regarding the United States and, and how we're seeing things in the Indian Ocean. Um, so those two questions that I, I sent to all of you is the first was, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted Europe's approach to the Indian Ocean region? And then secondly, what are the main challenges in the wider Indian Ocean region from your perspective? Now, those are obscenely broad questions, and I understand that, but that allows for you to narrow in however you see fit. Um, there, you all have a, a substantial amount of expertise to bring to the, the forum, so um, I'm going to let you kind of run the show and, and how you present. So um, I'm not going to follow the same order, so I probably have known him the longest, so Faraj, I am going to put you on the spot to kick us off, if you do not mind. So the floor is yours. Happy to start, Jeff. Um, thank you again for having me here today. On the uh, first question of how has uh, COVID-19 impacted 
Europe's approach to the Indian Ocean region. I think, firstly, um, COVID-19 has had a, obviously a significant impact across Europe itself, and uh, especially in the UK, where I am sitting. So that's one factor itself with the Europe dealing with its domestic challenges, which is uh, obviously will have an impact on its ability to engage with um, the Indian Ocean region. I think during the, uh, the pandemic, there's been um, close engagement between um, European powers and Indian Ocean powers, namely uh, India in this respect, especially on, in terms of uh, activities such as repatriation of citizens and financial assistance. And I think that has been one of Europe's um, main approaches in engaging with Indian Ocean region during um, this uh, pandemic. And the, I think notably one, uh, the financial assistance to Indian Ocean region countries during this pandemic has mainly come from uh, countries such as India, from China, from the US, uh, from Australia, from Japan. So the members of the Quad um, have been providing financial assistance um, to most of the island nations. The EU has provided uh, loans and grants to some of the island nation partners during this pandemic. So the EU has provided a $24 million grant to Sri Lanka, um, an $84 million aid package to Nepal. Um, the European Investment Bank's given a $20 million loan to the Maldives. And you've had also UK giving uh, £21 million in aid to Bangladesh. So that has been notable. Um, but I think what also has been significant is the absence of major European partners in the um, in the Quad Plus discussions that have been taking place. Um, so we've had um, on with Indo-Pacific partners with uh, India, Australia, US, and Japan. But then we've also had uh, countries such as Brazil, um, Israel, South Korea, Vietnam. So with countries such as Brazil and Israel involved in these conversations, was their room uh, for uh, European partners, France, for the UK, to be involved in these conversations as well. And uh, I think just finally on the first question, I think from the UK side, aside from um, the uh, engagement with India in terms of uh, repatriation of citizens and other uh, issues, I think what was notable during this pandemic is the calls between, for example, the Foreign Secretary in the UK and uh, some of the um, Indian Ocean Island states. And I think notably uh, was Dominic Rubbs, the Foreign Secretary in the UK's call with the Maldivian president in, um, uh, in April, where there was a strong focus on engaging further on Indian Ocean security. So I think that was uh, a positive sign, especially with a UK that has recently opened an embassy in the Maldives. And I think that that uh, is a promising aspect of the way forward as countries um, start adjusting to this new normal. And then on the second question, <clears throat> I think, um, well, the main challenge is obviously the, uh, the, the main one is the, I think, um, in terms of the major power competition between countries. So you're now um, uh, with potential basically for political tensions to rise within the Indian Ocean island states uh, with the major powers. India's increasing its engagement with all of the island states. During the pandemic, it's provided an assistance mission to uh, Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, and then also to Comoros and Madagascar. So it's the first time uh, that an assistance mission from India has gone to all uh, five, con five island nations in the uh, Western Indian Ocean. So I think that is significant. You're seeing obviously China, this engagement with these island nations has increased. There's been a lot of focus on um, 
continuing uh, Belt and Road Initiative projects from uh, Chinese ambassadors in Nepal and the Maldives. Um, and uh, I think that is notable. You're obviously seeing more US engagement, Japanese engagement, um, Australian engagement with uh, these island nations. So that is one, the rising geopolitical tensions. And uh, I think that was basically showing the most evident part of that was shown in January when uh, the, on, in a two day period, I think the Chinese and Russian foreign ministers and the US uh, top diplomat for South Asia, Alice Wells, and the UK's top diplomat for South Asia, Gareth Bailey, all visited Sri Lanka in a two day period in January. So I think that was uh, evident of the geopolitical competition. And I think uh, just secondly and finally on, um, on this question, to give before others uh, add their views, is um, the, a challenge, I think, is actually the limited uh, coordination and cooperation between the different um, regional security architectures operating in the Indian Ocean. So the, uh, the three main ones of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, and the Indian Ocean Commission. So I think um, each of um, the main powers, the US, India, China, are either members of observers of these groups. India has also just become an observer of the Indian Ocean Commission. So uh, I think it's important that these groups start um, either coordinating more or um, separating in their aims and objectives so that the, uh, the regional security, the three different regional security architectures in the Indian Ocean aren't all doing the same job and that there is um, clear differences between the three um, of these. But that's my first uh, inputs on this. I'm happy to answer further questions on this. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, your are well taken. Uh, long have people criticized the South Asian alphabet stew, so to speak, of, of various international organizations. So. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical of the ability for the three organizations you mentioned to coordinate, but to demarcate from each other what they're specifically going to focus on, I think is a much more realistic. Um, thank you for that, uh, kicking us off in, in, on the proper footing. Um, I'm going to turn to you uh, for your responses to the two questions, if you do not mind. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Me? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, well, so on top of everything which has been said, uh, I, I would say that the COVID-19 has affected uh, Europe, the European approach, and more specifically, in my case, the French approach, in different ways. First of all, it was very clear from the very beginning that everybody was adopting a much more inward-looking posture uh, in the initial stage of the, uh, the crisis. Uh, there has been a gigantic repatriation effort uh, at the very beginning, the closing up of a number of countries, and this definitely had a very direct impact on very concrete cooperation. Nevertheless, even during that period, uh, for us, French, it did show something, because where we had to intervene was in the Indian Ocean, was immediately in La Réunion and Mayotte, and the French Navy, for example, was actually operating uh, in, in those two islands because they are French territory. So if there was any need for it, uh, it did underline uh, that we are indeed uh, uh, an Indian Ocean uh, power and had to behave as such. The second thing is very quickly though, despite all the difficulties that I've started mentioning, then uh, we resume cooperation with some specific actors. I'm thinking in particular of India, there had been law, there had been uh, 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 opening up of trade for medicines and so on and so forth. So, you know, we are clearly seeing a, a relationship which is of a different nature, which is in a way extremely normal uh, regarding to the kind of relation uh, that we can have in other and so on and so forth. Third, uh, 
speak of specifically European approach with uh, the concept of Cramayo, which is a wide shipping uh, agreement, uh, training programs, and so on and so forth, which is operate, which was operating so far, especially in the Indian Ocean Commission, but which is now uh, actually just a week ago started uh, a new set of activities in the Bay of Bengal and so on. So the European Union is also increasingly present in that part of the world and demonstrating the sort of activism which didn't exist in the past, but which is in a way comforting as to uh, what we want to do. So yes, clearly it has affected European approach, but it's gradually coming back to not normal yet. That would be exaggerating, especially since a good deal of uh, the Indian Ocean is still uh, still not reached the peak of the uh, uh, the pandemics and is likely uh, not to reach it immediately. So that's going to complicate matters. But in terms of approach and activities, we're tending to know more as much as we can. Regarding the uh, the challenges. I fully agree with the previous speaker when he said that actually the main challenge is to build an architecture in the Indian Ocean. I don't know if you can speak of cooperation. You speak of the Indian Ocean Commission and the IONS. These are two different animals in any case. One is essentially a talking shop and a Navy chief. The other one is an intergovernmental agency which coordinate a set of activity which include, of course, maritime security, but who are mainly focused on economic activities and so on. And we could have mentioned IORA as well. Now, there is one thing which is interesting. If we look at the kind of challenges that we are actually facing in the Indian Ocean, I think there was an underlying not so long ago in IISS, if Antoine wants to speak about it later on, which was the fact that the actual challenge is not purely military in the area. It's also about this combination of resource appropriation as well, backed by uh, uh, military uh, involvement in the region, military build-up. And therefore, it does involve a set of activities which are not really natural, uh, which are not, the, the Indian Ocean is not really to, to deal with or was not really dealing with right now. And this is what we are actually working on now, trying to build up this architecture. So is that a slow process? Yes. Is that a painful process? Obviously. Uh, and, but there are ways to go about it because this is not going to involve everybody in the same way at the same speed. There are countries that are clearly in the receive, at the receiving end when it comes to capacity building and so on. And there are countries with capacity which we can mobilize both in the EU and in the region. I'm thinking of Australia, I'm thinking of India, I'm thinking of uh, uh, other countries as well, where we can actually start doing things which will help everybody reappropriate its own resources by controlling, for example, its own EZ and so on and so forth. The last thing, and I think this is not totally insignificant when we speak of the region right now, is COVID or not COVID, what's happening in the Himalayas right now has not really escaped our attention and we're deeply aware of that and therefore we like accordingly whenever the time arrives. Uh, but this is if you ask me what the main challenges are right now, this is what we see and what we're already involved in. The COVID has been not a step back, but certainly a pause into all this, but we're gradually getting back to uh, a pace of activity, which let me say is far from being sufficient right now, but is uh, increasing as we, not as we speak, but let's say uh, as months go on. Thank you. I, I believe that's very well said, sir. Uh and uh, I think the, the, the kind of fixation, especially on, on my side, so to speak, from the U.S. point of view, of the security sector is always kind of being preeminent in the conversation, um, does miss the point, so to speak. So I think your, your statements related to, um, especially in the maritime domain, understanding the resources uh, available through the sea to Indian Ocean regional states is critical, and then how to secure those both through traditional security means, but also in, in the non-traditional, uh, is a critical kind of effort that all stakeholders in the region need to, need to pursue. Um, I think that's incredibly well said. Uh, uh, Antoine, I, I'll move to you um, for our next set of comments, these questions. The floor is yours. Jeff, thank you very much, and uh, thanks again for the invitation to join. Um, 
A lot has been said, and I do agree with uh, everything which has been said. Um, what can I add? Well, I can join the, my colleagues in, in, um, in, in uh, assessing that there has been a dip of, uh, of, of engagement. Um, we can assess how temporary that may have been, but certainly at the um, state on state level, um, that's been the case. Um, I should add that in that context, um, the only true um, Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific wide conversation of defense ministers, the Shangri-La dialogue, as you, uh, I think, pointed out earlier, Jeff, did not take place this year. So um, that is a big loss for uh, not just the resident and the um, further uh, afield powers, um, but it's a loss also for region because um, one of the... Um, priorities which was set in the last few years was really trying to engage the so-called smaller island uh, and literal states of, uh, of the Indian Ocean in particular. So that is a loss for regional defense diplomacy. Um, I think one of the implications, however, uh, has been that um, it's been uh, possible to assess the extent to which um, resident countries um, Frédéric talked of France, but, um, but India uh, in particular, um, has been able to demonstrate uh, its ability to evacuate its own nationals from um, uh, further or far enough afield for it to be meaningful in terms of displaying an update on its, uh, on its whole of maritime capability. Uh, uh, um, um, score. So I, I think that's that's important. Um, that said, there has been state-on-state um, state, um, uh, diplomatic of another activity which has been continuing and some of it has been relevant to a maritime domain. One thing which um, again Frédéric mentioned is, is the relationship between France and India. I think the French ambassador in India made a very um, clear um, uh, statement on a number of occasions that France was was very much um, continuing a number of its priority engagements with with India, uh, including on the maritime domain. But we also saw, secondly, this um, strategic agreement between Australia and India, um, and that has implications because, of course, Australia is part uh, as is. Uh, 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 India of the Quad, and that has an important sort of uh, uh, underlying political message uh, around major power uh, rivalry. And thirdly, of course, we've seen um, greater Chinese engagement uh, with a number of literal and island states, as Viraj highlighted, and that in itself should, I think, prompt everyone to think about what they can bring to the table of these states, given that the Chinese are also engaging. Um, the uh, EU, I think, has also shown some ability to, uh, to, to, to continue its activities. Um, the 25-year anniversary passed last month of the Euro Mar 4 uh, involvement, and that's, that's, an important, uh, uh, that's an important milestone. Um, but there is, in my view, also a question about the EU's political ability to now argue its um, capability or its ability to, um, to help uh, on crisis management uh, issues. And that is uh, important because crisis management tends to be one of the lower hanging fruit um, uh, of, of, of cooperation in the maritime domain. And it's a trust building and, and confidence building exercise which generally benefits uh, everyone uh, uh, in, in a given area. So I think there'll be a question about, about that, but it can be overcome. And finally, COVID has also, uh, if I understand uh, matters um, correctly in the UK context, has also delayed somewhat the UK's own defence review. And the result of that has been that um, the UK's uh, so far missing statement really on the Indo-Pacific and, um, and on the Indian Ocean by, uh, by association is, is still missing. It's, uh, I think, in the works it will come. Uh, but it's an important, um, uh, I think, expectation we have of a, of a P5 country, um, especially in the Indian Ocean context. But challenges, they've been discussed, I think, already. Um, I think there's a question of prioritizing uh, traditional versus non-traditional security. 
in uh, defense um, between um, external um, countries or, or major powers, but also in how these countries uh, relate in defense diplomatic terms to regional states, including India, but also the small island states. The small island states tend to have that focus on, on uh, non-traditional security first priorities, whereas the major power competition element is ever stronger in, in, in major power uh, strategic thinking. And those two logics uh, do, um, do come together, can intersect, but, uh, but can also uh, be um, uh, 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 perhaps a zero-sum uh, uh, game also. Um, secondly, I think the main challenge more broadly for the Indian Ocean region is unchanged from, from a few years ago. In my view, it is to, um, to strike the right balance uh, of militarization of that region so that um, a number of um, anti-piracy and other public goods um, provided by defense um, uh, can be sustained, uh, but um, in, uh, an, an, in an environment which realistically includes major power competition in, 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 greater, uh, in greater degrees than, 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 than ever before, but at the same time preserving um, competition from really uh, altering uh, that space dramatically and making it a space of, of competition, making it a discrete new theater for, in particular, US-China uh, competition. Not so very long ago, the US and China still cooperated on, on counter-piracy in, in that region. Uh, there were even counter-terrorism exercises uh, done together. Um, Things have retreated somewhat from, from that, but I think there's still scope to prevent um, uh, that region from becoming a new discrete theater for, for competition. Um, and then lastly, I would say perhaps understanding the motives of, of China's um, uh, engagement with that region better. Uh, Post-COVID in particular, um, you know, what, how exactly did China uh, come to, um, to respond to the pull factor from the region in, in, in the COVID uh, crisis, and, and what is it trying to opportunistically draw from, from, that, uh, from that response to, to, to regional countries. But also um, the question of, um, of, of, and that's more to do with island states and littoral states, the question of fisheries, um, how do you engage with uh, Chinese um, fishing fleets um, and what are the implications in constabulary terms, what are the implications for um, uh, for uh, for Coast Guard cooperation, but also obviously for more traditional uh, naval cooperation. Um, and there's a, another question of, of whatever the uh, what 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 may be the time horizon for um, for the entry of carrier groups in 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 the in the Indian Ocean uh, by uh, by the the PLAN. And, and what really that will um, that will bring in terms of signaling and of intent and messaging? You know, how do we interpret that? Um, Pack, um, I have multiple follow-ups I already want to ask, but um, uh, I think there's some themes developing. In it, but Antoine, one of the things that I, that you brought up that I want to to highlight is the the issue of the non-security, the non-traditional security aspects. That, um, especially island states and smaller littoral states um, are faced with protection of fisheries, illegal dumping, um, essentially the blue economy and how its impacts there um, create all sorts of secondary and tertiary um, uh, security crises that can that can have a regional um, implication. I mean, we saw this clearly in the end of uh, you know at the start of the kind of Somali piracy issue that you know. One of the contributing factors was the collapse of, of local fisheries. So, um, all, all very interesting points. Um, our final uh, sp speaker, and not uh, because of any bias, uh, Verla, to you, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, look, I'm not going to try and repeat what um, my other uh, fellow speakers have already said, because um, I think they've done a fantastic job so far on covering really a number of different issues. Um, I think maybe I'll start off by saying that 
Uh, when it comes to how COVID has impacted Europe's response to the Indian Ocean region uh, or approach the re Indian Ocean region, I mean, I think one thing that we need to really keep in mind is uh, our own economic impact. Um, sitting from London, of course, we were already considering this uh, in previous discussions on how Brexit impacted or will impact uh, the UK's approach to Indian Ocean region and to the Indo-Pacific, not least in economic terms and what it's able to resource towards these objectives, but also um, when it comes to its immediate neighborhood uh, and uh, where, it priority, uh, where its priority must lie uh, in the short to medium term future. Um, Secondly, there is, of course, also the issue um, that Brexit now is being followed up by COVID uh, that has compacted some of the economic concerns here in the UK and undoubtedly also in European uh, fellow uh, countries. Um, and then thirdly, Antoine has already mentioned the, uh, the delayed defense review. I would note that this is a delayed integrated cross Whitehall cross government review, um, which really uh, incorporates all uh, foreign policy thinking uh, on the part of the UK. Now, that obviously uh, is a complicating factor in determining how the UK can approach the region moving forward, but it's also an opportunity. Um, so I would say that this is a perfect uh, time for the UK to take stock uh, of what it's done so far in the Indian Ocean region and in the Pacific, um, to engage and to try and consolidate what it's done so far. Um, thirdly, to engage with uh, like-minded and partner organizations and countries uh, to try and see where they could add more value, where things can be maximized more, uh, and to finally advertise. Um, I think in this whole discussion around COVID, we have um, immediately jumped on uh, the, uh, I think, panic bandwagon that China is proactive in its strategic communications, that it is proactive in trying to dominate the narrative space. But very often, this is not a new situation. We have seen this before, time and again. We saw it with Belt and Road. We saw it with other Chinese initiatives. China is just very proactive at doing this. We need to be more proactive ourselves. We need to reflect a little bit better as to why what countries like the UK or countries in Europe, what they are doing in the Indian Ocean region or elsewhere may not be getting the same public profile as what China's doing. And often what we're doing or what European countries are doing is very significant. Um, and a lot of resources are being diverted to this region. So I think there's an issue around needing to, um, to be a bit more proud and to make a bit more public uh, what we're already doing in this space. Um, I think secondly, this point that you raised around non-traditional security issues is fundamental uh, to this part of the world. Um, and I would draw everyone's attention to uh, the, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, who um, has spoken publicly about the need to ensure that um, the recovery of Commonwealth countries uh, must be sustainable, must be green, uh, and that one area of particular focus is the maritime domain. Um, I would note that um, about 46 of the 54 Commonwealth countries have a, a maritime coastline. Um, many of these are also small island states or, or other uh, large uh, ocean regions. Um, and so here, I think, again, is a real opportunity and a real need to understand what the uh, needs are of these territories, um, how they can be better facilitated in overcoming some of these uh, transnational uh, issues, be it illegal fishing, be it transnational organized crime in other areas like drug, tra drug trafficking or uh, people smuggling. Um, and you know there are ways forward for this. The UK has, for example, through the Commonwealth, also proposed a blue charter. Maybe this is something to, to look further into to moving forward post-COVID. Um, I would also note that on this issue of uh, the alphabet uh, soup, as you put it, of um, regional architecture, um, I agree with my fellow speakers that there is a lot to be done here uh, when it comes to coordination, but I agree with Faraj. I think coordination here is important. Um, I'm always slightly hesitant about calls for reinventing the wheel when it comes to regional architecture, when it comes to new initiatives. And so one thing that I think we could do is look at how European partners together with the United States can perhaps find 
uh, common themes, commonalities, ways of engagement between these uh, institutions. And I take Frédéric's point that uh, these are absolutely different creatures, uh, that they have different mindsets, they have different objectives and roles, um, but there is, a, there is a thematic crossover in quite a few of these sub-issues that these groups look at, and this is something that I think is important. Um, finally, as well, I think when it comes to these non-traditional security issues, uh, Antoine mentioned fisheries, we at RUSI have done a comprehensive study of a number of countries across the Indo-Pacific region on illegal uh, fishing, IU fishing, uh, and the crossover with transnational organized crime. Uh, we've taken stock of what uh, the responses have been so far and how countries uh, deal with this, um, and also looked at kind of wider trends. Um, but when it comes to, say, fisheries, uh, I would note that the UK, for example, isn't uh, a, a partner or an observer of some of the regional uh, fisheries organizations. Again, this is something that I think is really key if we're looking at trying to address regional, transnational, um, non-traditional maritime security issues. Some of these fisheries groups are actually quite important to engage with. So this is, I think, another area that, that is worth looking at. And potentially, finally, Antoine mentioned uh, maritime law enforcement, mentioned the Navy. All of these state-based actors are incredibly important. But as countries, uh, I think, face real economic resource limitations due to COVID or otherwise, uh, engaging uh, and using some of these state-based resources might be quite difficult. And so, one, I think we need to look at how we can help some of these countries with their maritime domain awareness capabilities and to help in capacity building with that. But secondly, I think we also need to be keenly aware that there are opportunities for non-state actors to take advantage of this. Uh, to take advantage of this distraction. Um, and one such a, an issue that I'm particularly interested in and have just published on is uh, private maritime security companies. Now, those are not necessarily nefarious in and of themselves, but I think there is a, a need for greater regulation and, of course, looking at how some of these PMSCs uh, might be used strategically in the future. Um, I specifically look at China in that space. I think when we look at China, um, the, the immediate focus is usually the Navy. It's looking at the kind of big ticket, high end uh, visibility uh, of uh, the Chinese military forces. Um, but there are so many more other strategic layers to, to China's uh, engagement uh, outside uh, beyond its borders and in the Indian Ocean region specifically. And that is something that I think uh, a dialogue, more dialogue about this issue, uh, more information sharing about this issue and more research on this issue is key. And I'll leave it for uh, at that and maybe take questions later. Thanks. Okay, uh, also adding to my the difficulty of my job, um, lots of information to dive in there. Um, I, uh, relative to several of your points, um, we have seen already a massive uptick in illicit networking activity in Southeast Asia um, and in parts of South Asia as a result of the fact that maritime security um, uh, actors by state, uh, in relation to states, have been focused on dealing with the COVID pandemic, um, and they have already exploited this tremendously. Um, so that is something that is a, a current crisis. In fact, uh, NISA will be having a conversation with some of our Southeast Asian partners uh, in a few weeks about that very topic. But um, I am in a, unapologetically, uh, as an American, um, all of you have brought up or referred to in some way, shape, or form uh, the the ever-present specter that dominates strategic conversation in the United States, and that's China. Uh, so I'm going to use my moderator uh, kind of power to to ask about the, the China issue now. Um, and from there, I, I do want to go into the, the more traditional, uh, the, sorry, the more non-traditional threats that all of you have, have rightly emphasized. But I think, um, Avera, I will use your, your point about the communication. And I guess the issue here is, how real and substantial is China's outreach in the Indian Ocean? Um, and as a follow-up to that, um, how quote-unquote nefarious is it? Um, there is a lot. Um, China does get a lot of, of boost from its sort of strategic communications uh, hype. That China does one small thing and everyone praises it. As the as like the saving grace, um, but 
at the same time, it's clear that China is substantially enhancing both its capabilities to impact the Indian Ocean region, as well as its economic interests and diplomatic outreach to the countries of this region. So um, I guess my question is, uh, how do we navigate all of the hype and uh, overreaction um, and, 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 you know, um, fear of China and get into the kind of real substance of, of what China is doing. Um, so uh, I see that, well, I, Ferry, I see your hand went up um, and then down, but if, if you want to go ahead and jump in, I'll, let, I'll give the floor to you, sir. Yes, I want to jump in because I think we need to requalify somehow the China threat because we we tend to perhaps overreact to uh, some of the Chinese infrastructure building and uh, uh, not emphasize enough some of these low level activities uh, that we see here and there, which are actually much more threatening to our interest and to the interest of a lot of countries in the region, but which go most of the time unnoticed because they are not as spectacular as either infrastructure or military buildup. On the military buildup to start with, uh, you know, we tend to constantly look at the issue of um, the freedom of navigation and so on, which is obviously an essential component of uh, the free and order, or, uh, the, 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 the international order as we, as we know it and would like to preserve it. But I mean, let's face it, there is no reason why China should suddenly be willing to stop the uh, or interrupt the sea lane of communication because that would be against its own interest. But there are a number of things which have been mentioned at length in, uh, in the previous intervention about uh, are you fishing and so on and so forth. This is a migrant threat in many ways because this goes largely unnoticed. And this is creating unbalances in many countries, especially along the eastern coast of Africa, for example. But if you look, for example, at some of the Cromario reports, you have uh, countries complaining from Iran to South Africa from uh, uh, Chinese IEU fishing. Uh, this is not insignificant for the population when you consider the 40% of the fishermen in the world are located in the Indian Ocean, right? Uh, this is something which goes largely unnoticed because it takes many forms. Not all of them are spectacular as uh, fi Chinese fishermen fishing in uh, various regions and depleting the stocks. Uh, and at the same time, this is a real threat because the ways uh, they are operating, first of all, create a dilemma as to the kind of uh, answer, the kind of intervention that would be necessary in order to counter this. And it has real, although it's a, uh, uh, how could I say, sub-strategic issue, this has a real strategic impact everywhere. Now, let's try to narrow down the field in which we European can and should intervene perhaps uh, more forcefully. You know, even in the region, you do have a set of norms which is developing. I mean, the code of conduct of Djibouti, for example, was created as an anti-piracy uh, set of norms. It has evolved into something which is now much larger under the general amendment, including IEU fishing, including a lot of things. Now, where the problem is, is at the monitoring level. Most of the little state of the Indian Ocean do not necessarily have the capacity to ensure the control of their own uh, EEZ and so on. So this is where we can actually do things. This is where capacity building should take place and so on. But that means also that in terms of cost, we speak of something which is much more limited. Because if it's a question of training, this is not terribly clear. I mean, part of the cost, when it exists, can be shared by uh, the recall states themselves, and so on and so forth. And there is a lot of room, actually, to do very efficient things. I was mentioning by my program, which I believe is something extremely useful for the entire region, which is now expanding from the southwest of the Indian Ocean to the Bay of Bengal and so on, which ultimately, especially if it's coordinated with the uh, fusion center in Delhi or uh, uh, even in Singapore, should give people a much larger 
awareness of the maritime domain. So this is the space in which we are operating where we can do tremendous results, notwithstanding the fact that actually a number of EU member states are individually doing things when it comes to uh, those issues. So that's where we are, and this is perhaps where we have a large space to operate and we can do things and continue to do things in a very efficient, not spectacular way. I agree entirely with what has been said in terms of uh, publicity, narrative and everything, because this is absolutely essential. As European, we are terrible at that and uh, we spend a tremendous amount of money to just be ignored both by the Chinese, by the locals and by you, the Americans. And this is probably, as a European taxpayer, one of the most frustrating aspects of the whole thing. But this is a reality as well. Frederick, uh, that's uh, that's incredibly well said. Um, I will take issue with one thing that you mentioned, though, and that is that uh, um, I don't think that Europeans have the worst uh, strategic comms. Uh, I still think that the United States is is the worst at that too, especially given um, some of the conversations I have here in D.C. It's almost as if the the United States and China have switched positions. That China is this uh, ever-present leviathan that is around the world, and the U.S. is backed into a corner with no options, uh, when it's the exact opposite. Um, and so uh, there, there is definitely a, a feeding point there um, where I think something about the West in general, uh, whether it be the NATO allies or, or Europe and North America, or however you want to phrase it, um, are just... For whatever reason, we're bad at this right now, and uh, everyone talks about it being uh, a problem, but there seems to be no necessary improvement in it uh, from year to year. Um, so, yeah, uh, anyone else want to follow up with uh, the issue of, of China uh, broadly um, as it relates to the question I asked, or, or you know, to add on to, uh, to other things that have been... Uh, Antoine, I see your hand went up, and then we'll answer... Antoine, to you. Me? I can hear you, yes, you're good. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, no, but I think it's important to remember that, um, that China has uh, a reason to cooperate with other powers in the Indian Ocean owing to its um, energy dependency uh, on hydrocarbons in, in the Gulf region uh, and Middle East more widely. And that means that um, energy stock security is, is still very important. And one implication of militarizing the Indian Ocean um, is that you have a, a more prevalent, what I would call, grey hull dilemma. Um, they are used, uh, naval platforms can be used to um, um, uh, help secure um, uh, stock, um, uh, uh, commerce and, and, and navigation, um, but on the understanding that, um, that these uh, capabilities are directed only against non-states and, uh, and, and certainly not um, uh, between other states also taking part in that um, collaborative or coordinated effort. And, and I think that um, it, it's that, that dilemma is central to, to the way um, China can, can be seen to behave in the Indian Ocean. And I think we should, um, we should remember that uh, that energy dependency is, is, is critical in that respect. I ran a series of workshops um, three, four years ago um, in our office in Singapore where we spent three days with uh, some Chinese and uh, Japanese um, and some Indian um, uh, civilian and military um, uh, uh, professionals discussing this. And that was a major takeaway from that uh, set of free conversations that really, if you take the continuum between, um, between the Gulf to um, the South China Sea and even um, further north, the Indian Ocean is perhaps the space where there's um, there's greatest convergence uh, on on the need to um, really insulate that trade from, um, from from greater power composition. And at the time, I think um, the Chinese were very well on board, and I don't see any reason why that um, rationale would be ever weaker now, 
considering that that energy dependency is still there. Thank you, Antoine. I think that's well said. Um, I deal often uh, as part of my responsibility, NISA, with a lot of the GCC states. Um, and there is a there is a very rational conversation happening among those those states re related to both their security dilemmas as well as their economic necessities. Uh, and their economic necessities are leading them to the east, while the security uh, practicalities keep them tied to specifically the United States and, and European powers. So um, it is definitely a transitional kind of focal point um, that that you can you can gain some specific insights. So thank you for that. Um, as to our level, um, before I move on to uh, the rest of the hands raised, um, we are getting uh, short on time, which always happens in these conversations. So let me add one more question. Um, one of the things I think everyone also brought up, whether it be talking about international organizations that that operate in the in the IOR or um, the various kind of engagements and methodologies that various countries, whether of the region or not of the region, are are working on is that there seems to be a question about the connective tissue of the Indian Ocean region. Um, if they are connected, they're not connected in in ways that are, are relevant for the particular challenges, or they're just not connected. Um, if any of you would like to add your thoughts, your views on that issue, um, I would appreciate it, uh, because I think it's one of the things that the United States is focused on. Um, that's highlighted during the COVID period, that we're doing a lot of great things in the wider Indian Ocean region, but inside the U.S. government alone, people aren't aware of it. Um, it's, either, it's either isolated through an embassy team um, in a specific country, or it's underneath a specific uh, institution within the Department of State. And so these are all things that are, that are building these connective um, uh, ties, but they're not... Uh, getting into this kind of strategic uh, calculations that the United States is making. So um, I'm just going to add that level of complexity to what I've thrown already uh, onto all of your computer screens. Uh, but the next up in our uh, round of raised hands is Verla to you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, that's a really important question. Um, that last one that you raised. Um, I think, you know, the whole the whole issue of also having all our own stakeholders in the region communicating effectively with each other, not least with their headquarters back at home, is one of the issues that can be improved on uh, to really ensure that whatever uh, initiatives are being done, whatever projects are ongoing in the region, that there is at least uh, within our own ministries and within our own governments uh, an awareness and a cohesiveness to what we're doing uh, in this part of the world. Um, I mean, there was so much that was just spoken about. Um, I think one thing maybe uh, when it comes to the, the connective tissue or uh, the, the different architectures and engagements in the region, I think one thing that, that really could help this is maybe um, more... Uh, I mean, this sounds very simple, but more dialogue. I don't mean for that to be a flippant statement, but um, I was in Madagascar last year where, um, you know, there were discussions around the need for a, a greater maritime dialogue for the Indian Ocean region. Um, I think there's also a specific EU, uh, and by EU, I mean Europe, European, uh, which would, of course, include, include the UK, European and uh, US uh, initiatives in the Indian Ocean region that could look at specific maritime security themes to have more of a, uh, a strategic discussion uh, and a more focused discussion, which could bring in so many of these different regional organizations uh, and could have uh, more of a, a uh, I think, uh, manageable uh, discussion with uh, concrete inputs for what these different organizations can do within their own frameworks uh, when they when they have uh, you know when they leave the discussions. So I think that's one area where where we can think of maybe um, looking forward. Uh, I think maybe just very quickly because I don't want to take time away from Viraj. I know he still has his hand up. Um, 
I think when it comes to China and when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the profile that it gets, um, again, I think a lot of this profile, of course, uh, filled a, was a result of China filling with very big ticket, very kind of flashy projects, uh, a, a perceived vacuum in a lot of these countries of engagement. Uh, and so that naturally caused a big bounce. It, it caused a lot of fanfare. You know, the launch of Belt and Road added to that as well publicly. Uh, and China, we can't forget, as, you know, a perceived leader, uh, or at least a, a, a desired leadership of the global south, um, that is something that China identifies uh, its role to be and something that certainly some countries, some developing countries, um, look towards China for. Um, and so we can't just dismiss China's uh, activity in this part of the world when it comes to things like infrastructure. We are not great infrastructure builders ourselves. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, as Frédéric so, so rightly pointed out, a lot of the engagement that we, that we do just isn't really headline making news. Um, it's not necessarily very um, intriguing or, or something that the general public, uh, you know, looks at and is a hugely impressed by in some of these countries. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that we can't find a way to communicate those efforts better. Um, and I think, for example, working with governments on uh, when we look at the Belt and Road and my specific area of interest and expertise, which is port construction and the Maritime Silk Road, I think there's a lot of work that we can do and a lot of work that we can publicly do on working with governments to train them, not just around things around, uh, you know, contract negotiation or uh, impact assessments, which, by the way, as the Belt and Road will need to multi multilateralize more in future uh, and will look to become a greener Belt and Road, certainly there's a road for, there, there's a, I think, scope for countries to work with these recipient countries to work on uh, more effective ways of dealing with uh, some of these uh, projects and proposals, um, but also to try and work with some of these countries on things like how can a port potentially, uh, say, a fisheries port, because not everything China does is, say, container shipment, but fisheries ports, how will that impact their, their maritime domain awareness? How will that impact their own resource uh, control? Uh, what is in some of these clauses? I mean, all of these issues are, are ways that we can certainly engage. And as many of these littoral countries start to refocus on their blue economy strategies, um, there's, a, there's quite a lot of work to be done here. Um, that's, that provides, that, that's very informative on a whole host of issues. Because um, that question has been coming up a lot recently in Washington about everyone has accepted the technical expertise offers our way to, to get involved in the Belt and Road kind of, um, kind of landscape, but now everyone's realizing that's not sufficient. That's not a uh, silver bullet, so to speak. So that, uh, what you just mentioned, related to port investment, different forms of infrastructural assistance um, is it, key. Thank you so much. Viraj, uh, thank you for your patience. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'll only be brief and add to what uh, fellow speakers have uh, correctly said before. And uh, so I'm say on how you asked how real nefarious is the China threat. I guess that uh, for governments, it depends on where you're sat if you're in the Indian Ocean region and which government of the day is in. Uh, a particular country. So, for example, if you're in the uh, previous Abdullah Yameen Maldivian government, the China threat is a lot more friendly than if you're in the current uh, Ibrahim Soli government. So I guess that's uh, an important point. Um, and I think um, just one point which I wanted to, uh, I should have raised previously on the challenge, but also on an increasing role of China will be actually the impact of COVID on the tourism industries in uh, these Indian Ocean Island states. And China makes up, for example, 25% of tourists in um, the Maldives. So if European tourists are not willing to travel for that long distance for the foreseeable future, but the Chinese tourists are willing to travel, does that mean China's soft power efforts in these uh, island nations is just going to grow more and more in the coming months? I think that's something to watch, just the leverage of soft power that China could get as a result of uh, the pandemic. And uh, thirdly, I think I uh, fully agree with what uh, Vela said. I think communication, messaging, 
advertising is the most important uh, thing. I think countries in Europe have been more or less uh, successful in this. I think the French uh, Indo-Pacific policy document has been very useful. Uh, and the UK's uh, lack of documents has been not useful. And the UK, for example, uh, said um, in December 2018, when it announced it opened its embassy in the Maldives, it uh, announced that it was uh, UK was looking to be a net security provider in the Indian Ocean region, um, uh, which I think India is the only other country that is mainly saying that statement. I don't even think U UK officials realised that that statement uh, was hidden in this uh, document. So, mention of that I've seen since. I think that's an, a key thing on terms of messaging and how some countries have been a lot better within Europe on messaging. And then finally, just to add on, on the connected issue, I think um, sub-regional dialogues is really important. Smaller dialogues, there's the, uh, there's, well, there are so many um, of these regional architectures, but I think the most important conversations can actually come, for example, in the groups of three, two, three, uh, sorry, the groups of three or four countries that speak together. So the uh, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives meeting at the National Security Advisor level, that needs to be resumed because I think you can gain a lot more understanding of what these smaller countries want in these smaller groups, which can then be built upon uh, during the larger regional architecture meetings and on the sidelines of these meetings. Well, that's all I have to add for now. Thanks. Uh, excellent points as well, and, and to add on to your the the, the countries, um, I, I participated in a very fascinating conversation last week related to the the, the Diego Garcia complication related to Mauritius uh, decision by the UN um, uh, regarding Mauritius's claim and how the UK is responding to that and what options exist for the United States, um, and I think that uh, format where all three parties. Uh, provided a ground for people to do analysis and then the isolated echo chambers or the US and the UK being on one side versus uh, the UN bodies and Mauritius on the other um, just having Mauritius the UK and the United States they in that conversation uh, was incredibly helpful uh, for for hammering out uh, where the real conflict lies and where there actually is consensus on some of the complexities so excellent points there um, uh, related to that. And then finally, uh, Frederick, you have been incredibly patient. Um, I will turn it to you, sir, for your comments. Now, well, very briefly, uh, without contradicting anything which has been said so far, I mean, I think that the, the what you call the nefarious character of the uh, China policy in the area has to be seen in dynamics as well. We are no longer seeing the kind of investment that China was doing only three, four, five years ago, this has clearly declined, and this means that in terms of visibility, China's visibility has also declined. Up to us to do our job in order to compensate for that and, and appear, uh, uh, be taken into perhaps more seriously sometime for what we actually do. Uh, but uh, China's policy is not something absolutely linear, likely to grow indefinitely forever. The second thing is, I think uh, th th there's no Indian Ocean and so on. I mean, uh, we all face the same problem. We, we, we are all divided into uh, geographic, uh, geographic directorate, thematic directorate, and so on, and they never really coincide with the uh, uh, strategic reality of the moment. Uh, a concept like the Indian Ocean, basically, for the DOD, for the MOD, for us, MEA, uh, us, uh, uh, MOD is essentially a strategic concept, and the only way to reconcile that is probably the Indo-Pacific. Why? Because again, this is a construct, and I think the Alan Ginger put it uh, quite nicely. This is a construct around a, uh, a set of interests which are specific to each country. But there, we can work out some coordination where not everybody will take care of just everything, but where we can coordinate, which means that. Coordination rather than cooperation will mean lesser cost, lesser waste of time, less waste of capability, gain of time of efficiency, and perhaps an action better adjusted 
to the reality of the various places where we're interacting. So there is probably something we need to interact in this, and I'll stop on this. Uh, I think a great way to end this. Um, we're approaching on time. Some final comments for me. Um, oh, Antoine, you had a, a final interjection uh, to you. Um, a couple of ideas. One, I think it's important to have um, two plus two, so defense and diplomacy uh, dialogues, uh, as much as possible maritime dialogues, um, focusing partly on the Indian Ocean. There are specific um, situations, um, challenges, opportunities to that region. It's important to, have, to devote some time to that specific space in, in those um, um, whole of government or at least uh, not ministry specific um, conversations. Secondly, um, France has taken over the chairmanship of the uh, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium for two years. That I think is a major um, opportunity, uh, certainly between major powers, simply because France is a resident um, of, of, that, um, of that region. Um, we haven't spoken of climate change and the implications of um, the security implications of climate change, but it seems to me thirdly that um, whenever the COP22 is, is convened uh, in, in Glasgow, um, it would be worth uh, trying to carve out some space for not just um, the security, the maritime security implications, but perhaps looking specifically in, at the Indian Ocean. Um, and finally, fourthly, um, the U.S. State Department has started this blue dot network, um, higher quality infrastructure um, um, uh, label. Um, and I think it would be important to uh, build some greater understanding of what it is and what the opportunities are for partners uh, in the region, but also um, potential uh, financial uh, supporters further afield. And we're back to... Uh, to major powers, but including uh, countries like Japan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Um, all of uh, the Blue Dot Network, I will make sure to disseminate that to everyone I uh, communicate with on a regular basis. Like, there's interest, but not everyone is sure what it is. So how about we, uh, we, we correct that? That's a simple correct. Um, so who is next? Uh, Verla, you were the next on my roster for, for uh, a comment, so to you. Yeah, sorry, I know that we've approached time um, and we're all raising our hands to talk quickly, but um, I just wanted to say, you know, building on this, uh, this point, uh, Frédéric, which is uh, that the Indo-Pacific really offers opportunities as a, as a strategic concept. You know, I, I completely agree, but what we don't do enough of is have uh, enough of a conversation as to what the Indo-Pacific really is. Um, we are banding, bandying around this term, uh, which we know is maritime, which we know um, is, is a strategic area of competition uh, and one that will drive future economic growth uh, globally, um, but we don't talk about the limits and just, you know, the, the actual boundaries of it uh, and what we're really looking at geographically um, as well. And so one thing that's really struck me already in this conversation is that we haven't really spoken too much about, uh, you know, the littoral states of the African continents. Um, uh, we talk about uh, the small island states, we talk about the Indian Ocean Commission, of course, but we don't talk enough about um, East Africa and we don't talk enough about uh, countries beyond Somalia. Uh, and when we're talking about some of these main uh, transnational organized crime networks, uh, they very much extend across the African continent, of course, especially when it comes to wildlife trafficking, especially also when it comes to drug trafficking. Uh, and so this needs to, I think this needs to be uh, a focus moving forward to, to try and find more uh, concrete ways of, like I said, stop taking of what's already being done. And, you know, the Blue Dot Network is uh, is a keen example of this, where uh, an initiative has been put forward, but many countries don't know what it is, and they don't know how to engage with it. Uh, so that, I think, moving forward um, is something we can all do better. Uh, well said, Verla. Uh, shamelessly self-promoting. Um, I, myself, at NISA, do, do a lot of work related to the Red Sea region and to the, the Western Indian Ocean broadly. So um, uh, I'm happy to, to 
to connect with those who are working on that. But you're right. The Indian Ocean region is massive, uh, and there's no way we can get to it all. Uh, uh, Frederic, uh, to you, uh, sir, for comments. No, well, I mean, there are reasons why we don't speak about those things that they don't really exist yet. The Indo-Pacific is basically what we want it to be, and this definition will depend upon our own national interest. That's why I was talking, uh, this is a, this wonderful quid pro quo that we can use in order to coordinate our efforts. And if we understand it as that, then there are a lot of possibilities and everybody will be happy. But the point I wanted to uh, address before we stop this conversation, you ask us what is it that the U.S. should do. There is something you're doing wonderfully in the DOD uh, in the Pacific with the FSCP, FESP, sorry. Uh, the, 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 no, the PESF, uh, uh, Pacific Environmental Security Forum. Why don't you extend it to the Indian Ocean? I think there are a number of issues are very similar, both for the little states and the island states uh, in the Indian Ocean that they are over there, and that will perhaps also change the perception in the, uh, of the U.S. in part of the Indian Ocean where the U.S. is not really involved. Now, if you want to go uh, a little further, we spoke of capacity building and not just of military build up. That's probably where you can be active as well. The third thing is about cooperation. I mean, needless to say that I, we fully understand that part of uh, the U.S. government wants to cooperate. The message we get from the top is not exactly the same, and it would help if there was more consistency in the U.S. narrative about those things. Now, if you can help on that things, where you will change your perception by your allies, by your potential allies in the region, and definitely help us on the ground, including in terms of coordination efforts. And this is my real last point. I think it's a it's a well said point. Um, I, I take that uh, that recommendation to heart. Um, to, to have some final concluding thoughts uh, before I get to my thanks to all of you. Um, I think the issue about the Indo-Pacific being helpful um, as, for right now at least, for however we want to use it, is because one of the issues for the DOD that has been particularly problematic for years in the Indian Ocean has been the demarcation between uh, the, the combatant commands. India specifically has always hated that uh, you have Indo-Pacific command, the you have Central Command, and you have AFRICOM, Africa Command. Um, but the Indo-Pacific has allowed a lot of those kind of problematic issues to be overcome or at least sidestepped. And for India and other countries to understand that reaching out to different COCOMs in the United States DOD has been, can provide benefits. And so India now has a, a, as a, a naval officer stationed with the 5th Fleet in Bahrain, um, which um, is, is a new development that is helpful and it, and it creates more diversity about uh, the input that the United States gets as well as how India perceives what the United States is doing. But the other issue about coordinating activities, um, I have been a, uh, I have evangelized uh, the French Indo-Pacific document throughout the U.S. government just because I think it's, it, it was, it's fantastic, not only in how it was unveiled at Shangri-La. <laughs> but well, the other thing I love about it is it clearly states um, what France uh, does in terms of its ceiling and its floor in terms of capabilities, which is absolutely immensely important, and the United States continuously does not do well. Um, but some of the things that I bring up to add to what all of your comments is uh, the, the United States has, is increasingly expanding the, the Maritime Security Initiative, which was focused on Southeast Asia into the Bay of Bengal, uh, and there's talk of, exp uh, of expanding it further. The U.S. advantages when it comes to professional military education and institutional building in that capacity is something that is increasingly being linked um, together. And I think that the greater specialities that all of the various allies and partners um, that are present in the Indian Ocean can do, um, that is the coordinating mechanism. And, and to return to everyone's point, all of us do things really well. We're just not communicating about what those things are and then how we can operate. The Blue Dot Network is a perfect example of a, of, of a U.S. effort that is a great idea, but no one really knows what it means outside of the specific people working on it in the U.S. So um, I will take all of these to heart. Um, do know this, that this series will continue. Uh, 
uh, for the foreseeable future COVID or not. So don't be surprised if I if you get uh, emails from me in the future asking you to come talk about m even more specific topics um, related to the maritime domain, the Indo-Pacific, um, various issues related to great power. Um, but but finally today, thank you so much for carving out time um, and, and for joining me. Uh, I've learned a great deal. There's a lot that I know. Um, those I speak to within the DOD and the State Department here in the United States will be very interested in hearing. Um, and so you've you've just given me an education. So thank you for that. Um, it's about to be the 4th of July holiday here. Uh, so we'll be shutting down for pretty much for the rest of the week. Um, but I hope all of you have a good remainder of your week, uh, a happy weekend, and continue to remain safe and healthy uh, for the foreseeable future. So thank you all. Uh, and take care of yourselves. Thank you so Thank much. You,